This season of Storyophonic is sponsored by Universal Audio, pioneering audio recording for more than 60 years. Find out more at uaudio.com. Welcome to the digital airways of Storyophonic, an ongoing conversation series presenting the people, personalities, and perspectives of the modern music business. I'm Dan Kimpel. With our fourth season, we continue to introduce you to those in the spotlight and behind the scenes, and all of our Storyophonic subjects are right here with us in person. It is our objective to entertain and inform you as we reveal tips and tales from deep inside the music industry. She first came on the radar playing keyboards with the Arsenio Hall Band. Since then, she's performed or recorded with artists from Carole King and Carlos Santana to Mariah Carey. As a composer, Star Parodi's illustrious credits span feature films, episodic television, concert works, and solo piano artistry. To me, music is emotion. And when I was growing up, I listened to a lot of soul music. That's pretty much all I listened to. And so even though I, you know, soul music is not necessarily what I write when I'm writing to picture, I still feel like that influences everything I do because of just the communication and the emotion and kind of the warmth behind the music. Recently elected president of the Alliance for Women Film Composers, Star exemplifies a multifaceted career that continues to expand. Star shines brightly on Stereophonic. Star, so great to see you in this moment. Oh, it's really great to see you too. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you. I want to start in the present. Um, in my world, you know, I'm seeing a wonderful wave of women composers, possibly because of people like Chris Beck or Dr. Laura Carpenter or Miriam Cutler, people who've been our guests. But I understand the reality of that as well, and probably nobody understands it better than you because you are now <laughs> the president of the Alliance for Women Film Composers. Congratulations. Thank you. So talk to us a little bit about, from your perspective, what it looks like. Wow. There's a lot to talk about. I don't know any women who are composers who want to be known as women composers. Right. We're all just composers. Many of us have been composing for many, many years. And, you know, the reality is that up until, you know, the past few years, there's been very, very few of us. And it's been kind of maybe an insidious thing where we didn't really realize that there was maybe some sort of a prejudice, you know, or maybe it was very subtle, or maybe it just wasn't even known. But it's just kind of weird that there were so few of us. I don't want to quote the exact percentage, but I believe it was 3% two years ago that were scoring the top 250 films. It went up last year to, I think, 6%, and I think it's back down. And as more of us are getting out there and being more visible, I believe that it's really encouraging a whole new generation of women to become interested in what is a really fascinating, totally fulfilling and creative career. It's just been a really wonderful way to give more visibility to women without doing anything disparaging to guys. And there are male advocates for this, as we mentioned, Christoph Beck and many other other composers within the composing community who are championing this as well. Absolutely. I mean, George Clinton has been a huge supporter and has been on our board. And, you know, there's many, many amazing guys who are our supporters and friends and colleagues. It's just really bringing more awareness and creating more opportunities for women to be at the table. You know, and I think that more studios are doing blind submissions, which I think is really wonderful. You know, up until a certain time, symphonies were mainly male. And then uh, the thing that changed that was blind auditions. And I believe it went from, it was either 2 or 4% women to 38% women in a year when they did blind auditions. So, it, you know, it's just all kind of changing you know, what people may not even know is a mentality. What they may not know is a perception. Changing that by seeing more women be just featured in composition. It's very interesting what you said, a young woman coming up, why would she want to get into a business that if she had no 
point of reference to being in that business. Yeah, know, so. I mean, it's so true. Yeah. You know, I've given master classes and spoken to classes for composition, and there are maybe one or two women in them. Yeah. So now that's changing, and there's more tools out there, too. You know, people are getting more familiar with technology and different ways to create demos, and it's easier to express yourself musically now, I think, with all the different tools and all the different samples and computers and all the different tools that are at our fingertips now. You have a very interesting collection of old school and new school right here. <laughs> In our presence, I mean, one of the instruments that I passed on the way in, I believe, is a, a 1928 Steinway Grand Piano, oh. which is fabulous. Tell us about that, that instrument. Oh, my gosh. Well, that is my heart. That is really the heart of my musical life. I'm a pianist. I was always hired to play synthesizer for people and playing with different bands as I was coming up, but I always felt like I had the heart of a pianist, and I, I did a... Uh, solo piano record, um, maybe about 10 years ago, my first one. It was during another session, and my husband just said, hey, you know, you should just record something. And he really loved what I was playing, and he wanted me to record it. And anyway, I feel like I finally found my voice on piano, and it's just been my go-to for writing and for expressing myself and for communicating with other people. But that piano in particular, I found just through a search, basically. I didn't know whether I wanted to have a new piano or an older piano. I was really open to everything, and I was driving all over town. <laughs> and the cool thing about looking for pianos is that you meet all these really wonderful people. And sometimes they have two pianos in their house. We had jam sessions. You know, you go to a music store, and you get to you know, play a lot of different ones, but when you go to people's houses and you're driving around, everybody's piano has a story. So anyway, I ended up in Riverside on a ranch with this guy who, I think he worked at the Academy of Music in uh, Philadelphia, and he had about nine or ten pianos in his house, and in one room was this piano that I have, it was kind of put over to the side, and as soon as I played it, I just felt like my heart was stirring inside, and then it became his daughter's favorite piano as soon as I liked it. <laughs> so I was like, oh my gosh, no, no, here we go, you know. So I couldn't even bring myself to negotiate, you know. And anyway, I ended up with the piano. I had Brian Alexander, who's just a wonderful piano artist, technician, you know, uh, rework it because it had some sticky keys and some stuff. But the tone was just amazing and still has the tag on it from, uh, from MGM from the, from the late 20s and 30s. And uh, it was said to be the piano that The Wizard of Oz was recorded on. And it has gum under it. <laughs> and, I, and when they redid the, the piano, I wouldn't let them scrape the gum off, you know, under the, under the keyboard, because who knows whose gum that is. <laughs> uh, maybe it's Judy, Judy Garland's I gum, know. because her original name was Francis Gum. I mean, who knows, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Thank you for that insight. We get to hear you very wonderfully express yourself on piano in The Heart of Frida which is a, uh, a recording that you did, a full-length recording. It's amazing, very gorgeous piano playing and conceptual composition there. And it's about Frida Kahlo, which is interesting. What is your connection to Frida Kahlo? Oh, well, a couple of connections. My dad, before, uh, before he met my mom, had kind of another life living in Mexico. And was married more times than I knew <laughs> after he passed away, I found out. And, uh, and so he was, he was much older when he met my mom. He was almost 60 years old. And so he had had all these other lives and was actually a contemporary of Frida Kahlo. I don't know that he knew her, but there was this mystique about him in Mexico. And I always wanted to kind of explore that because he was just such an amazing guy. He was into alternative energy before it became popular, you know, and he was just, you know, an Italian immigrant, but just a can-do, never complain, very, very motivated and driven, wonderful man. So I wanted to kind of explore this mystical part of Mexico that that I didn't really know too much about of him. And then um, put that with several years ago, 
I was commissioned to write some music around Frida Kahlo's artwork for the Laguna Pageant of the Masters, which is a wonderful show that happens in Laguna Beach, California. And the theme of the show that year was the muse. And she was the muse of Diego Rivera, her famous uh, painter husband. And all the other muses were just kind of I don't know, they were stifled, and they, you know, of all the other artists that, that were being portrayed in the show, they had unrequited love, they died sad and penniless, and they did all the work with no credit or whatever, and, and Frida Kahlo had this strong voice that came out through an unbelievable amount of pain, through, you know, her physical ailments, and she came out with this really strong sense of self, that really inspired me. And I've seen pictures of her. She actually painted herself to be less beautiful than she was. She was actually very, very beautiful. And sometimes she looks very severe in her paintings. But I don't know. There was just something about her and her strength that really touched me. There's a track on there called The Elephant and the Dove, which is a, uh, it, it refers to the physical disparity between Diego Rivera, who was a very large, corpulent kind of man, and Frida Kahlo, who was a bit more diminutive, <laughs> yes, yeah. which I always found an interesting interesting balance. Yeah, you know. I thought that was a really cool nickname for them, I so I wanted to write a song called that. And included in that, uh, another song I wanted to ask you about, which is interesting, it's, it's a reimagining of the song When Doves Cry right? Um, by Prince, and you also have a version of that, not on that record, but a single uh, instrumental and vocal version of When Doves Cry with Lewis Price, who is an R&B singer. He came after Dennis Edwards and The Temptations, part of the long lineage of great, soulful R&B singers. When I was listening to your version of it, I guess I never noticed what a simple song it is. Yeah. How, how there's there's very little like chordal transition within the song. Right, not a lot, no. but they're the right chords. Yeah. Yeah. Prince chose the right chords, you know? <laughs> yeah. First of all, I've always been a huge fan of Prince, sure. and I love his music. I've always loved that song. And the words, why do we scream at each other, always really stood out to me. It took it out of the more personal, two-person kind of thing and made it more universal to me. So I initially recorded it on my solo piano album because I was just thinking the dove, the dove, the dove, Frida and the dove, you know, the elephant and the dove. And I was thinking, well, this would be a cool song because it could relate to her, but it's also a song I really love and want to record. When I was doing a concert for my solo piano release record, Lewis Price, who's my dear, dear friend, he and his wife, Faye, uh, who's a director, author, writer, amazing, amazing family. I just asked him if he would like to sing it with me. We just did kind of a a very spontaneous version of it, and people just really responded. And I was just thinking, wow, you know, when I was recording this, I always kind of heard his voice singing it. So we decided we should record it too. It's just interesting where it starts with the why do we scream at each other. And it reminds me of, of what Prince himself did when he recorded a Joni Mitchell song, A Casey You, and he began halfway through the song. You know, I'm a lonely painter was his right. first line in the song, which, which is, it happens much later. And, and I just thought it's an interesting recreation or way, a way to, to honor them by, by, you know, just reimagining. I guess that's the word. I don't right. Know. Yeah, I, f- yeah. I feel like it's not really a cover. It's no. really uh, just taking, hopefully, you know, some of his in- incredibly inspired lyrics and, you know, putting them out to the world. And Lewis, you know, he is just the most amazing. Vocalist. What a great tone. Yeah. You know, Chicago's. You yeah. Know? <laughs> no, there's no substitute for that. Oh, man. For that, 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 yeah. the life force that goes into a yeah. vocal like that. His mom, by the way, who's 90 years old, is such a powerhouse. Her name's Vernon Oliver Price. She's famous in Chicago as a gospel singer. And I have never seen her sing where the audience didn't jump to their feet. She is, she just brings it. She's an amazing, amazing woman. Wow. We watched a, a very cool video clip called A Legacy Discovered that you're involved with. Oh, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. Um, um, wow, that was that was a really amazing experience. And just very recent, just yeah. last month. Yeah. Um, my daughter, who is 16 years old, she's a violinist and a singer-songwriter, 
and we've been playing together since she was five. <laughs> so we have kind of a unspoken way that I know what she's going to play. She knows what I'm going to play. And, you know, she's still a teenager. And so it doesn't mean that she likes what I'm going to play. <laughs> but I mean, we know each other very, very well. And sometimes we could ask to play together. We were playing for uh, Word Theater, which is just a wonderful group in L.A. that brings literacy to underserved schools, headed by Cedaring Fox, amazing talent herself, a voiceover talent, and, and just incredible putting people together. And she called and asked my daughter and I if we would play. We'd done uh, several concerts at, at the Ford Theater with her and at the Grammy Museum recently. Um, I, you know, put stuff together for her, for her, her actors. And so my daughter and I played at a party, just one song. And this guy called me the next day and he, Abe Gurko, and he said, I have to have you guys play an interpretation of my great uncle's music, who was a concentration camp prisoner, a, a child prodigy, a composer. And he put together an orchestra in this camp and really brought a lot of uh, hope to the people that were in the camp. Um, he smuggled a piano <laughs> into the camp somehow. And, I mean, it was just amazing. And so, sadly and, and tragically, he was murdered uh, a few hours before the camp was liberated. And so, years later, many of the people from the camp who were in the orchestra wrote down fragments of his melodies. And Abe, the great nephew, got a hold of these. He's a filmmaker. And he just felt like he wanted to make a film about the legacy of Wolf and his music. So he's been taking these fragments of melodies around the world and having different artists perform them. He had a symphony, I believe, in Berlin, he had uh, a wonderful gospel choir. He had a wonderful singer, Antonique Smith, in town, an artist in Mexico City, a really wonderful pop artist. And he had my daughter and I do it. And I'm sure he'll have several more, but it was just playing his notes and knowing where they came from. Again, reimagining them because there was no guideline of how to do it. It was just a melody. So it wasn't even chords. We kind of felt his presence and felt his spirit, and it was really an honor to be able to play his music and interpret it. Your daughter appears to be well on her way to some remarkable achievements. Um, it's not too many teenagers that I'm aware of who were able to put music to the words of Hillary Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's pretty amazing. Yeah. She's amazing. She's had some amazing opportunities, but I think it's because everything that she's done has been from such a pure place. Mm. You know, it hasn't been like a look at me or, you know, from, from a trying hard place. It's, she's very diligent. She's been working, yeah. you know, very hard practicing um, her instrument and honing her craft since she was just, you know, a couple of years old. So she has a gift of being able to connect with people. She just wanted to take the part of Hillary's concession speech that was non-political, but that was speaking to girls and saying, hey, never, never doubt that you're valuable and powerful and deserving of every opportunity, you know, in, to pursue your own dreams. And those were the words that my daughter was given and said, you know, okay, your assignment is to write a song with those. So it wasn't really about politics. It was more speaking to girls to know that they're valuable. One of the things in the studio that I saw as I walked in here was a beautiful picture of Marilyn Monroe, which my research tells me that was from the last session she did with Bert Stern. Yes. And you did music to a, a documentary about Bert Stern, the original Madman. Yes. He was he, an amazing character. He had just an amazing life, and it was so many things, so many photos that I grew up with as a yeah. child that were iconic, including, I think, the Lolita with the red glasses, the heart glasses. He took that. He took a very iconic, um, if you're into advertising at all, which, you know, I've done a lot of music for advertising as well, that kind of historic picture of a pyramid in a martini glass. That was kind of a game changer for advertising because before that, I think women were just holding soap and saying, you know, here, we wash your clothes with this, you know. And he came out with this really 
bizarre, elegant, uh, kind of different way of, of advertising. And then, of course, the Marilyn Monroe photo was taken from her last photo session, which was several weeks before she died, and it was for Vogue. Anyway, it was just a surprise. He had it in a little tube, and he brought it over and said, hey, I just brought you this gift, and it was this beautiful photo, kind of black and white with hyper color on certain parts of it that he had taken of Marilyn. This connection that you have between the visual art and music is very interesting, and it's certainly a through line as I examine projects that you've done, um, that you seem inspired by art, you seem to be able to somehow to musically parallel or to frame art in certain ways. You mentioned the pageant of the masters, and for our listeners who aren't familiar with that, um, it's been going on for, like I say, 85 years, as I think you mentioned, and um, it's, it's a physical recreation of very famous paintings using people posing <laughs> you know, and I don't it's, know how they do that. I know. It sounds really strange, but it's yeah. really, it's amazing, you know. And it attracts all kinds of, of attention. Um, my next door neighbors went to see it and they recognized one of the gentlemen in the audience who was really admiring the work and his name was Bono from U2. And so <laughs> different people will go and see this and it's, it sounds bizarre, but it's, it's, it's incredibly detailed work. You've been involved with that for a while. Right. Um, I think this year was our 11th year. Uh, It is such a hard thing to describe, but uh, it's a show. It's in the Irvine Bowl, which is kind of like a mini Hollywood bowl. It's an outdoor amphitheater that holds around, I think, maybe 2,800 people. It's on the summer nights, you know, so you have the stars above, and then you have this big, beautiful stage where they actually paint people, and they have artists that work all year figuring out which kind of paint to use and what costumes and the sets, and then they put them in frames, (laughs) large frames, and then they have a a full orchestra that plays along with the story, and so... Just imagine that you're sitting in a museum and you have an orchestra, you know, playing music that's, a, and you have a narrator telling you about that painting. And then, you know, remove the painting and put living people there. So and it's, it's just pretty cool. Um, the script writer, Dan Doling, is just a totally fascinating storyteller. And he has the greatest insights in the paintings. So many paintings that I've worked on, I've looked at. And I would never know. I think there was one, Madam X, and she was painted with straps on her dress, but apparently at first it was strapless and it was scandalous. And then they had to paint the straps on. And, you know, the French people didn't like her because she was American and she thought she was all that. And there was like this whole controversy. Or there's a Van Gogh painting in a cafe and there's these reds and these greens. And I always just thought, oh, that's a cool painting. But no, it's this craziness, this underlying story of each thing, um, of each painting that really dictates the music. And so I find it's just this fascinating art history lesson. And Dee Chalice Davy is the director. She's a visionary. She puts the whole show together. And then there's always some kind of way that it's very universally touches people. As a composer, you mentioned that you had worked in advertising, uh, music for advertising. and You work in hyper art artistic settings right and you also work in very commercial settings and it's interesting i, I read a, a quote i think from philip glass just this week and somebody said sometimes people will call him out on that for it. but he's like well why why is it better to get a check from a university than it is to get a check from an advertising agency i thought that was an interesting perception yeah oh his music is amazing it's great too. but he you know again a composer that works in across a lot of different different mediums, you know. Right. Um, yeah, it's music. Yeah, it's music, and it's all expression, and it's all doing your best, putting your best foot forward. When I say advertising, I do mean movie trailers, mm-hmm. yes. although I have done other car commercials and, and different commercials as well, but movie trailers are a really fascinating 
form of advertising. I wanted to talk about that with you because I'm not sure that our listeners understand sometimes the timeline of that, you know, that the movie trailer is done well in advance of the completion of a film. Many times done before the film is even finished shooting. Yeah. There's not usually just one. So it can span, you know, before the film is shot to right before it opens too. And that's sort of the way that a lot of us are ex first exposed to a new film that's coming up. Um, I read an interview with you. you. You mentioned that trailers are done in acts. Yes. Can you talk about that? Sure. There's usually three acts to a trailer. Um, they're very short acts because a trailer is not very long. But there's an, an act one, which is usually a setup. It's usually not very busy. Then you go into the story part of it. And then there's usually in act three, some kind of a breakout where you hear, you know, uh, in an action movie, pounding drums or some kind of very, very driving music. So this is a very specific area of expertise, knowing how to compose for that format, correct? I think it is. Yeah. Funny thing um, with Jeff Fair, who's my writing partner, we composed the music for the United Artists logo. And that was, I believe it was 14 seconds long with some cut downs. And they also wanted it in three acts. They wanted like the past, present, and future of United Artists. And so we really had to kind of break that down and <laughs> think about that. That was kind of cool. I read an interview this week with a producer who's very much of this moment. He's a very young man. I actually happen to know him. I won't name him. The interviewer had asked him uh, if he ever imagined working in film, and he said, well, that's a fantasy of mine. He said, but the thing is, what in film, you have producers and directors, and they give you notes, and I, I don't really like working with notes. Now, well, <laughs> well good luck with that. <laughs> yeah. In trailers, there's usually a lot of people yeah. that give notes. In film, the director is the main person that you really want to realize their vision. In television, it's the showrunners mm -hmm. because the directors so often change for every show. So it's really finding the person or people that whose vision it is that they're bringing to life. And hopefully there's a method of communication. We notice with a lot of times composer, director, uh, they establish long-term relationships because they have a shorthand of communication. Music is, it's kind of a funny subject because it's easy to think that you know about it, but then people find themselves at a loss for words when they're trying to explain what they want. And it's really important to never make anybody feel silly because there's really no bad question. And part of the composer... Uh, relationship with whoever you're working with is to try to make them feel comfortable so that they can actually express what they really would like you to convey. And then you can also express to them how you're seeing their picture because they're so close to it. And, you know, in music, we get brought in so often towards the end. So we see it from such a different angle than them. And they may be saying, hey, you know what? This scene never worked, so put some music in it. <laughs> and you're saying, well, you know what? This scene, it's interesting. Maybe there's a different way to, to go about this, you know? So it really does become a conversation. I've heard authors say sometimes the outsider perspective is, is a very valuable perspective. So somebody who has not been inundated with it, you know, visually over years, perhaps, and you kind of come in and you see the, the musical component. Right. That's so astute. So true. Yeah, so so true. O over my shoulder is a gold record. <laughs> Over my left shoulder is a gold record. Yes. James Bond. James Bond. You know, I, see, I, I have to do fair use. There's a theme that's got, okay, just a couple notes. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, that's enough. That you, you reconfigured and re-recorded a version of that theme with very moody, interesting, but with real heavy guitar vibe on it, I listened right. to. Right. Yeah. Right. All the textures at the beginning were actually made by guitar, even though they sounded like they were synth. Just layers and layers of ambient guitar. So that's another example of you taking something that we think we know and finding a new expression for it. Well, that was for MGM. They asked uh, Jeff and I to come up with some ideas to reimagine the Bond theme. And I mean, how great is that, you know? And it was really before a lot of the themes had been reimagined because we also worked on Mission Impossible and The Saint and The Wild Wild West after the Bond theme. But before that, people weren't really doing a lot of spy themes, reimagining them. So we kind of had a 
blank slate. We just started to try some stuff and we thought it'd be really cool to have kind of a moody, very almost European kind of retro trip hoppy kind of intro to it you know and then go into the theme but but very guitar heavy as you say and we had a small uh small um brass section just uh trumpet trombone and sax three guys and um you know no piano in that one (laughs) (laughs) but it was it was just you know it was a real thrill to work with it um we did two, really only two versions of it. The first one, uh, the beginning lasted longer, and they said that they wanted to go in quicker to the, you know, kind of the meat of the theme. So that was really the only thing we changed. Christmas time is coming. <laughs> we have Christmas music that works on so many levels for us. You worked on a Christmas record. You did a, a track of a, for a Christmas record for Carol King. Correct? Yes, actually sitting very close to where you are right now. <laughs> wow. Air blooming. Air blooming, Air yeah. Blooming. yeah. Carol King was sitting here, huh? Yep. Well. Yes. <laughs> no wonder I feel so good. Oh, my gosh. Well, she is just such a talent. And to to do a piano vocal you know, recording with her was a dream. It was produced by her daughter, Louise Goffin, a very, very talented producer, singer, songwriter, artist herself. And she asked me if I would like to do this with her mom. So we recorded it here. You know, it was just such an interesting way of working because what I noticed about Carol is that Every note, you know, you know how like dancers sometimes uh, when you're watching them, and I know this is a podcast, so I won't be able to do this visual, but you know, they go through the motions and and they do it in a small way, you know, like uh, they just kind of um, go through the choreography, but they don't actually perform every single feet, you know, every single jump, whatever. Carol King performs every single thing. (laughs) Like for instance, there's just so much heart in every single thing that she does, every, every note. If she's singing at the dining room table, showing you something, she's not singing softer, or, you know, she's singing. I don't know how else to describe it, except that I just feel like she's just the consummate artist, and, and I was so inspired by her, and, you know, it's just a joy to, to play with her and yeah. record her. Was it scary on any level? No, it wasn't scary. I mean, I guess, you know, maybe I'm beyond getting scared anymore because, you know, I just, we're all just people, you know, but it either works or it doesn't. But I was just so glad that that worked. There's a British artist that you worked with. Is she British? Uh, Callahan? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was listening to her tracks. Wow. Isn't she wonderful? She's fabulous. She's really uh, coming, you know, an up-and-coming artist. Um, she opened for Paul Simon uh, last summer at, I think it was called, is it Summertime at Hyde Park? It was like a big, big concert there. Um, we wrote a couple of songs together um, that were, uh, I guess, BBC London Track of the Weeks, Um, and uh, Jeff and I produced uh, 10 tracks on her last record. She's a joy to work with. You know, she's just impeccable. Don't have to (laughs) auto-tune her. It just comes out really great. Yeah, there's a concept. Yeah. Oh, how neat. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I found that that was a really interesting thing that you were involved in. And again, one of these many threads of your... I know. Artistry. Well, she came to to me and us because she wanted to do a record that felt cinematic, <sighs> and um, she had uh, been living in Nashville and had done kind of a more country themed. Re- well, you know, it, it wasn't country, but in in the UK, if it's just a tiny bit country, or if you live in Nashville. They're like, ah, oh, UK country artist, you know. So she wanted to do something that felt very filmic. And that's why we did this together. Cinematic music. Yeah. Star, I became aware of you first playing in uh, the band for Arsenio Hall's television show. Right. And, you know, as I look back, there's a lot of sort of like late 80s retrospectives right now. Proposition 187, we just have an anniversary of that. Anniversary of the falling of the Berlin Wall. Right. And, and I think... It's easy to overlook, really, how important that show was and what a part of the cultural fabric that was, you know, to have a show that was that hip 
on late night television. Yeah, yeah, you know, you're. It's, it's so true. I, it really. It was really the early '90s that the show happened. It it was started in, I believe, '88 through '94. Yeah. Um, but it really had a feeling of the '90s yeah. to it. You know, um, it really set the tone. I think for a lot of shows, um, including you know Fallon. Even the floor, you know, I think Arsenio was the first one to have a black shiny floor. Now everybody has a black shiny floor. He really was a huge fan of the people that he had on. And I think that, that his, his genuine interest in his guests really translated to this very genuine experience, you know, where people really wanted to tune in. And he he didn't really differentiate by race. You know, he wanted everyone to come to the party, men, women, you know, any ethnicity, anybody from anywhere was welcome. And I feel like that was kind of the first time that that happened. And the musical guests were unbelievably curated. Oh. Yes. Everybody did yes. that show. Oh, my gosh. Well, that was the show to do. Sharon yeah. Olson, who was the music booker on that, was largely responsible for finding people. Radiohead, I believe, did one of their first gigs. I know that we played from Mariah Carey on her first you know, television appearance. John Singleton was an intern on the show. Melissa Etheridge really, I don't want to say got her start, but got more well-known. You know, Whitney Houston and Stevie Wonder were regular guests. Al Green, Mavis Staples, you know, B.B. King, Ray Charles. We played with them all. Bill Clinton, you know, <laughs> that was pretty cool. Playing for him kind of was a turning point, um, I'm told, in his campaign. Him mm-hmm. appearing on on our show. And did show. you not play the Clinton inauguration gig? Yes. Uh, An interesting story about that. We had been rehearsing, and then I had ironically just been in the in the makeup room with him. So we had been talking about different musical influences that he had, and I was curious about who he listened to, and we were just talking music for maybe twenty minutes, and then when we were waiting to go on um, to play. He and I were just standing backstage. I always waited for the bass player, John B. Williams, because he and I had an incredibly long good luck handshake that we did every day before the show. And I think this was like in 93 or 92 or 93. And so we had been doing the show for a while to make this handshake about maybe three or four minutes long. And so I was waiting for John and Bill Clinton came and, you know, it was just he and I. And so I completely out of character of anything I would ever say to anybody said it's great to have you as a guest and it's so fun to play with you and it's you know amazing that you're a politician but you play uh the sax and hope you win and if you do our band would love to play at your inauguration (laughs) (laughs) oh my god I couldn't believe my words came out of my mouth because I normally you know would have been very very shy about saying anything like that but um anyway he said if I win you guys will play And uh, he kept his promise. You know, after he won, he sent us all bomber jackets with the presidential seal. And we went to D.C. and played at the Kennedy Center, which was pretty amazing. That's great. Maybe you'll run across some presidential candidates and (laughs) let's not go there today. (laughs) I know, no. (laughs) Let's not go there. Yeah. 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 You're a studied musician. I I noted you had studied with Dick Grove, arranging, correct? Right. Well, actually, um, I didn't take his arranging course. I I was in his keyboard (sighs) program. (sighs) And the Grove School of Music was a very influential educational edifice here yeah. uh, in Los Angeles. Yeah, Dick was amazing. Yeah. He was he really spoke to people who wanted to work. He didn't go for the academia, mm-hmm. you know. He really was like, what will work in the real world? I saw one of our guests, uh, Terrence Blanchard, um, just did a new, I haven't had a chance to listen to it yet, but a new version of, of the Chinatown, theme from right, Chinatown. And I right. understand that you studied with Jerry Goldsmith. Oh, well, briefly, you know, BMI, Doreen Ringer Ross and Lucas Richmond put together this fantastic uh, conducting workshop, which was really conducting for composers because so many composers do conduct their own works. And it really adds another layer when you're able to conduct your own work because it just 
I don't know, it just infuses a little bit more of you in it, I think. And uh, it's something that many composers are are reticent to do because they don't know how, you know. And so um, Doreen and Lucas, Lucas is an amazing conductor and, and composer in his own right, put this whole conductor's workshop together. And Jerry Goldsmith was... was our teacher in it, which was pretty amazing, as well as Lucas. And, uh, you know, it was just 10 of us per session, and it was amazing. Doreen's been a guest as well on our podcast. Oh, man. You've had so, a lot of wonderful people. Yeah, yeah. I and mean, we're very women-centric. You know, that's been a part of, uh, of, of what, we, what we're about. And, but we're, we're open to everybody in the world, obviously. Right. It just kind, of back, just kind of goes that way sometimes, which is interesting. But Doreen's been such an advocate for for composers oh man she composers. is she is the composer's best friend she really she really just finds ways to put people together and to put programs together to help people yeah because you've worked in feature films you've worked in trailers you've worked in many formats episodic television being a, certainly a format that you've worked in a great deal right um, that has a whole other timeline to it does right it not? it's a stay up <laughs> All the time, <laughs> timeline, yeah. yeah. Until you find your your groove and your palette. I've had so many different situations with episodic television. I worked on a wonderful show called The Starter Wife with Deborah Messing. That was such a cool show, and she was wonderful. The showrunners on that, both women, and they fortunately gave the opportunity to come up with some themes before. The shit hit the fan, you know, and, and before it was just a total time crunch. Yeah. And so it was wonderful to have a few weeks to come up with some ideas and some themes. And then they really liked those themes. So then it made everything easy on that show. There have been pilots that I've worked on where I haven't slept more than a couple of hours for three days because it's last minute and they have to have everything. And, and they're kind of putting it together as you're putting it together. And there's often a committee because, you know, they want to get it sold, so they want to make sure everything is right. I've worked on some animated series, Transformers Rescue Bots. Again, it's super important to have a palette. Yeah. And once that palette of sounds and colors and vibe is okayed and, and liked by the showrunner, then I feel like you're really free within that framework to come up with really neat, uh, cool ideas. Oh, so you came to music very early on. You inherited certain artistic traits. If you weren't doing music, is there an alternative thing that you would be doing? <laughs> you know, what I always wanted to do when I was a kid was be uh, an astronomer. And I've always been, uh, I, I'm just like one of those weird people that, you know, I have a pile of books on my, on my bedside, and they're all about physics. And it's just something that I'm totally fascinated by. I, I'm pretty sure I don't understand half of it, but I just, you know, I'm just so fascinated by it. So I probably would have pursued something like that. You've obviously absorbed and studied music for a long period of time. How does the era when you grew up, the music of the era when you were growing up, how does that influence the music you do now? Uh, well, you know, it's so funny because to me, music is emotion. And when I was growing up, I listened to a lot of soul music. That's pretty much all I listened to. And so even though I, you know, soul music is not necessarily what I write when I'm writing to picture, I still feel like that influences everything I do because of just the communication and the emotion and kind of the warmth behind the music, you know? So, I mean... I also listened to a lot of classical music when I was growing up and studied, you know, classical piano. Um, so it's all just like a big melting pot <laughs> stirring in there, you know. <laughs> Who do you consider a mentor for you in the business? Or, or, or was there more than one mentor? You know, I've had a couple of mentors, although it's so funny. Um, when I was first starting to to write to picture, um, I, we just had the great fortune of meeting Mike Post, who at the time was probably the most prolific uh, television writer. This was in the, I guess, the 90s, the mid-90s. I was very young. I had never written for an orchestra before. And um, I think that at the time, 
you didn't even call someone a mentor. There weren't really mentors. I mean, now everybody talks about mentoring and it's such an important aspect of, of giving back and also, you know, relationships. But at the time, I just became one of his writers on his team. And so I think he probably knew <laughs> that I hadn't written for an orchestra, but we had an orchestra every week and uh, I wrote for them. <laughs> and that was really like jumping in the ocean and swimming. So I guess that was mentoring back then, but he was just incredibly supportive. And I was just so grateful to have that start, you know, to be able to be in a studio every week writing uh, for, you know, I believe he had like 12 or 13 shows at the time. And he had several people on his team and I was just so fortunate to be one of them. So he was a great mentor. In fact, it was so funny. I, I just saw him recently at a, at a BMI dinner, and I, I told him, you know, I said, you know, you are really, really so helpful. And he's like, you know, I think it made him feel really good because he, he didn't do it, I think, to be a mentor. It was just, it was just kind of the way he was. He was, he was always helping young artists. And um, another really cool person uh, that really helped me was Howard Richman. Ironically, he was the brother of the conducting uh, teacher, Lucas Richman, who was also my teacher. But Howard Richmond uh, was my, uh, my piano teacher when I was a teenager. He was teaching through UCLA. I was in high school. My mom would drive me, you know, to study with him. And I I was supposed to be practicing sonatas, Haydn sonatas and all this stuff. And I really was going and improvising and doing all, you know, writing rather than practicing what I was supposed to be practicing. And I would go to my lessons and sometimes I would be in tears and I'd cry, you know, and I'd have some excuse. Oh my gosh, you know, I was sick. I, I don't know what happened. I just can't play this now, you know. And one time I was in tears at this lesson and he just, rather than going off, and, and doing what a teacher might, you know, very well have every right to do. He just said, well, he, he got a piece of paper, a piece of score paper, and he just quietly sat down and wrote a poem. And I was just looking at him, sobbing, thinking, what is he doing? Why is he writing a poem? It's, you know, he'll probably dismiss me or something, you know. And he said, okay, well then, play that. And he put the poem on the stand of the piano, and I just started to read the poem, and I, and I started to kind of close my eyes and visualize what, it was a very visual poem, it was very simple, like the, the dark clouds are brooding over the sky and the rain is falling down, and I think that was what really started me thinking about writing to picture, because it was a visual, uh, it was really connected with me, it was a very visual way of thinking about music, and so I started to improvise, and I loved it. And so every lesson from then on, he would write something. And, you know, I was still practice classical, you know, and, and all, the, all the work that I was working on with him. But we would do this uh, every lesson. He would write a poem, and I would, I would close my eyes and try to visualize it and improvise. So he was a mentor, unknowingly, really, just a great teacher. Star Perotti, you're so interesting. Such a, a depth of knowledge and experience and so of this moment. And again, congratulations on being the president for the Alliance. We think that that's a terrific choice. Thank you. And uh, may you continue to make incredible music. And we thank you for being our guest on Stereophonic. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure. You've been listening to Stereophonic a regular podcast series with tips and tales from deep inside the music industry. We come to you from Datalite Studios in Los Angeles, California. Our show is produced and edited by Lindsay Tomasic. Our production manager is Kim Strand, and our theme music is by Dusty Gray. Please rate us on your favorite podcast platform, catch up with our past episodes, and visit us often for new shows. I'm your host, Dan Kimpel.